Well, good morning. My name is Brian, and this morning we're going to be returning to my series on origins in Genesis 1 through 3. And today we're going to look at Genesis 3, verses 14 through 19, and we're going to consider the origin of alienation. The origin of alienation. And as you find your place in your Bible or on your device, I'd encourage you to keep it open this morning. We'll be going back to it again and again. I love origin stories. Origin stories not only tell you something about the past, but they do it in such a way that it tells you what the world is like today. It tells you how the world is. And we find origin stories in our movies and our literatures, especially around heroes. In 2016, there was an animated film called Zootopia. And in Zootopia, Judy Hopps is a cute little bunny who wants to become, who dreams of becoming a police officer. And in a world of predator and prey, a cute little bunny is an unlikely police officer. But Judy Hopps is determined. And early on, there's an origin story scene in the movie where Judy, as a young bunny, looks out in the distance as she's talking to her parents, and she sees Gideon, who is a young fox, bullying two little lambs and stealing their fare tickets from them. And she goes over and she intervenes and she gets the tickets back by outfoxing the fox. And that cements her desire to be a police officer, to set the world right. And that explains why she's a police officer today, because that's what origin stories do. Today, we're going to look at the origin of alienation. And in the United States today, we have, in the history of the world, reached unprecedented levels of wealth, entertainment, comfort, technology, and travel. And yet, at the same time, we've also reached unprecedented levels of depression, anxiety, loneliness, and burnout. One out of 10 Americans in this past year reported being severely depressed. 20 million American, 40 million American adults, that's one out of five American adults, wrestled with anxiety. One in three American adults reported being severely lonely, either sometimes or all the time. Ann Peterson calls millennials, and you're a millennial if you're age 28 to 43, she calls millennials the burnout generation. You're full of emptiness and exhaustion. And every 12 minutes in the United States, someone takes their life. There are 41,000 suicides every year. Can you feel the alienation. In our origin series, we've looked in Genesis 1, the origin of everything, the origin of life, and the origin of humanity. In Genesis 2, we considered the origin of Sabbath, the origin of work, and the origin of marriage. And in Genesis 3, we looked at the origin of sin and the origin of shame. And today we're going to consider the origin of alienation. At the beginning of Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve reached for the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they took and they ate, they were grasping for the place of God. And as they did so, sin entered the world. Sin entered the world. And Adam and Eve hid in the garden, and God in love and mercy pursues them. And he begins to question them. And in their shame, they each blame the other. They cast blame upon the other. And now, in our passage today, starting at Genesis 3 and verse 14, God, the sovereign king, the just judge, 
comes on the scene to deliver the sentence. This is a courtroom scene. The interrogation is over. The verdict is in. And the verdict is guilty. And covenant blessings now will become covenant curses. And at the center of this verdict is alienation. You see, we were created for deep shalom, for harmony and community with God and with others and with ourselves. There was supposed to be a deep sense of peace. But today, we experience alienation in every aspect of our lives. We're going to look at our passage this morning under three headings. First of all, we're going to consider in verses 14 and 15, alienation in our world. And then in verse 16, alienation in our relationships. And then thirdly, in verses 17 through 19, alienation in our work. Alienation in our world, in our relationships, and in our work. And here's what I'm going to tell you this morning. Sin brought alienation and pain into every aspect of our world. But one day, Jesus will return and set all things right. Sin brought alienation and pain into every aspect of our world. But one day, Jesus will return and set all things right. Let's focus our attention then on Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 14. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this morning and we have sung your word and read your word and prayed your word, I pray as we consider the alienation of this world and the only promise of new life that is offered, I pray that you would convince us of our sin and misery, that you would enlighten our minds and the knowledge of Christ, and that you would renew our wills by the power of your gospel through the work of your Holy Spirit and the mediation of your Son. I ask that you would forgive the one who teaches his sins, for they are many. May we see Jesus and him only. Amen. First of all, this morning, let's consider together then verses 14 and 15, the alienation in our world. And these are the covenant curses that are brought to the serpent. So blame had been passed in verse 12 from man to woman. And in verse 13, that blame got passed like a hot potato from woman to the serpent. And so God begins his judgment with the serpent with whom all this began. And unlike the man and the woman, there is no interrogation here. God asks no questions. He just brings judgment. Look at verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed 
are you? Now, this is the first time curse appears in the Bible. God had blessed the animals in Genesis 1.22, and he blessed humanity in 1.28. He blessed the Sabbath day in Genesis 2.3. But now, in judgment of sin, God brings covenant curses. And he uses the formula, cursed are you, which only occurs two times in the entire Old Testament here, and in Genesis 4:11, where God curses Cain after Cain killed Abel. And part of the covenant curses is the ultimate and final defeat of the serpent, which is symbolized in the next two phrases: "On your belly you shall go." On your belly you shall go. This is a this is symbolic of abject humiliation. The serpent is face down in front of his enemies. And dust you shall eat all the days of your life. This is a colloquialism we'll still use today, right? Two kids on the playground might line up and one can say to the other, eat my dust, right? Both are symbols of defeat. And together they point to the ultimate defeat of the serpent. And how is this ultimate defeat of the serpent going to come about? Keep reading. Verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Enmity between you and the woman. So two Mondays ago, I'm sitting at my kitchen table late in the afternoon I'm writing and reading, and all of a sudden, Julia, our 19-year-old who's home from college, comes bursting through the front door. And she rushes over to the sink, and she goes, oh, it stinks. And she's washing her hands all the way up to her elbows with with soap and water. And I said, Julia, what happened? And when she calmed down a little bit, she was able to explain, well, I was walking out in in our neighborhood, and by the pond, I saw a snake. And so I I reached down, and the snake seemed pretty calm. And so I grabbed it behind the base of the head and picked it up and grabbed its tail, and all of a sudden, it pooed all over me. (laughs) Technically, it musked all over her. But, and she's like, oh, it smelled so bad, right? Enmity between the snake (laughs) and the woman. Now, I don't think that's what enmity means here. Enmity in the Hebrew only occurs five times in the Old Testament, and each time it signifies hostile intent resulting in murder. And God sovereignly puts enmity between the woman and the serpent in order to separate them. Because it was their conversation, it was their collusion that got this whole thing started. And so God separates the woman and the serpent with enmity and alienation enters the world. Once there was cosmic peace, this shalom, this beauty and harmony, community and connection. But that has been interrupted Conflict and enmity and hostility have entered the world. And the conflict isn't just between the woman and the serpent, but the next line, if you keep reading, it's between the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman, and the offspring or seed. It's the word is seed in Hebrew, or seed of the serpent. And this isn't referring to physical lineage, but to spiritual lineage. And seed theology has immediate consequences in Genesis. In Genesis 4, Cain, the seed of the serpent, kills Abel, the seed of the woman. It's hostile intent resulting in murder. And seed theology shapes the rest of the book of Genesis. The word seed occurs 59 times. In Genesis chapter 4, you're tracing the seed of the serpent. In Genesis chapter 5, you're tracing the seed of the woman. There's a phrase in in Genesis that's translated, these are the generations of, the seed of, the offspring of, right? It occurs 10 times in the book of Genesis, and it actually gives shape to the entire 
book. But then look at the third line. He will bruise, or perhaps better, the Hebrew there could be crush. He will crush your head and you will crush his heel. This is the ultimate defeat of the serpent. This third masculine singular he, this seed of the woman, it all comes down to this one person will crush the serpent's head. And the early church fathers read Genesis 3.15 as fulfilled in Jesus' victory over Satan on the cross. And they call this the first gospel, the proto-euangelion. And this defeat is pictured in Revelation chapter 12, as Wilson read for us this morning, where the great dragon, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, was thrown down to the earth. And he was conquered. Did you hear how he was conquered? He was conquered by the blood of the Lamb. In other words, right here at the very beginning, in the midst of the covenant curses, God promises to send a deliverer, a savior, the seed of the woman, who would conquer Satan, reverse the curse, and set all things right. And this is why we have genealogies in Scripture. We're searching for that seed of the woman who would come to defeat Satan. You know, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke records his genealogy in Luke chapter 3, and he, chase, he traces Jesus' lineage all the way back to Adam. And do you know what comes next? In Luke chapter 4, it sent Satan's temptation of Jesus. You see, Jesus goes to battle against Satan. But this means that alienation has become part of of our world. There's a cosmic struggle, an epic battle now between good and evil. Conflict and enmity and hostility have entered the world. And you can feel the alienation. And this is why we're so drawn to stories that depict good versus evil, a hero versus a villain. The first movie that I saw in the theaters was 1977. I was six years old, and the movie was Star Wars. And I was captured, like Luke Skywalker, you know, this Jedi and Darth Vader. And, you know, these were days before screens, and so I saved my money, and I started to buy action figures. Action figures, right? And you, you get Luke, and then you add Darth Vader, and, and Obi-Wan Kenobi, and, and Chewie, and, and Han, and you know, the, these early action figures, Luke Skywalker um, had his lightsaber stuck in his arm that you had a little switch here you could pull and the lightsaber came out and then you could battle, right? Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader. Oh, here's Obi-Wan, right? Good versus evil. And man, when I got to go over to Jimmy Miskell's house, Jimmy Miskell, he had the Millennium Falcon and TIE fighters and X-Wing fighters. And I mean, you could just play for hours. We're captured by stories about heroes. And then a year later, Superman came out. And a couple years after that, Raiders of the Lost Ark came out, right? These hero stories were at the center of my childhood, but I would argue that no matter what era you grow up in, there are always hero stories. Because deep down, we want to see good triumph over evil. It's hardwired into our souls. It's part of the meta-narrative of our world. It's part of the truest story ever told. We can feel the cosmic struggle between good and evil. It's in the fabric of the universe. It's part of the alienation of our world. And so we're looking for a hero. For a hero who will vanquish the villain, conquer death, and set all things right. And it's hardwired into our souls. Secondly then, in verse 16, 
We have alienation in our relationships. Alienation in our relationships. And these are the covenant curses to the woman. Look at verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. These are covenant curses. But the word curse is not mentioned here. It's just the consequences. And they're around childbearing, pain, and there are two different words in the Hebrew, but pain is mentioned twice. And multiply your pain implies that childbearing was already going to be painful, but now it's multiplied. And notice where this pain is inserted. In Genesis 3.15, redemption is going to come through the seed of the woman. Seed and offspring come through childbearing, and now that part in the process of redemption comes with a side of pain. Pain has been multiplied. Or the cultural mandate. If you go back to Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, right? And now that blessing to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth comes with a side of pain. Pain is multiplied. You see, pain is inserted both in the blessing of the cultural mandate and in the process of of redemption. And some commentators suggest that childbearing, which could also be translated pregnancy or labor pains, that childbearing could be representative. That is, it could represent the pain of motherhood or the pain of parenting in a general sense, which for the woman plays out in the next chapter. Because in Genesis chapter 4, When Cain kills Abel, the woman experiences the pain of losing a son. And losing a child is more grief than we should have to bear. The grief is overwhelming. But the woman had to live not only with the pain of losing a son, but with the pain of one son killing her other son. Her pain is multiplied in parenting by the entrance of sin in the world. She experiences alienation in our relationships. But there's more alienation in our relationships if we keep reading in verse 16. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now that word desire, your desire shall be for your husband, is tricky. It only occurs three times in the Old Testament. And here are the other two. Can I get that slide? Some suggest that we should read this as a good and natural desire, as in uh, Song of Solomon chapter 7. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. But others suggest that this is desire to control or consume, as in Genesis 4-7, when God says to Cain, and if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And I tend to think that the better reading is a second. It's a desire to consume or control. Thanks, Andre. But either way, What's more important is the second half of the verse. Did you catch it there? He shall rule over you. This is alienation in our relationships. Man was never meant to rule over woman. Together, they were designed to rule over creation. Can I get that next slide, Andre? In the cultural mandate, We have this, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and and fill the earth and what? And subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. But as a result of the fall, that dominion is now misplaced. Thanks, Andre. Now 
It's He shall rule over you. Wherever there's oppression in the world, especially wherever women are oppressed or abused or treated unfairly, it's the result of the fall. It's the alienation in our relationships. And according to the Bible, man and woman are equal and different. According to the Bible, man and woman are equal and different. Genesis 1 verses 27 and 28 is a picture of equality. God created all mankind in his image. Male and female, he created them. And together, he blessed them. Together, he gave them the command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. It's a picture of equality. But in Genesis chapter 2, we have a picture of difference. Because God made man first. Man was made from dust. Woman is made from man. Woman was made to correspond to man. And you can hear it in the Hebrew. Woman is Isha. Man is Ish. And you can hear it in the English, the correspondence, right? Woman and man. And correspondence implies difference. It's a picture of difference. In fact, it's precisely because of their difference that they are able to fulfill the cultural mandate. If they were the same, they couldn't multiply and be, and be fruitful and fill the earth, right? This is God's good design. Man and woman are equal and different. There's a harmony and a correspondence and an interdependence In the New Testament, Paul puts it like this. Can I get that next slide, Andre? Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. You see, that partnership That interdependence is part of God's created order, and it manifests different ways and in different roles in three different spheres. The sphere of home, the sphere of church, and the sphere of society. But this is all part of God's good design, and it's how we reflect the image of the triune God. Now, our culture tends towards one of two errors in this arena. One is that man and woman are different, but not equal. And the other is that man and woman are equal, but not different. And we can fall off on either side. One uh, well-known figure recently said, There's not a single thing a man can do that a woman can't do as well or better. Not a single thing. Or with the fluidity of gender today, the emphasis is we're all the same. Gender is just an expression of your choice. And these kinds of errors minimize the difference between man and woman. We're not all the same. Men have an X chromo- have a Y chromosome. Women can get pregnant, right? In God's design, there is differentiation. Man and woman are equal and different. But perhaps the greater error in the history of the world, in the history of our country, is that man, man and woman are different but not equal. You see, in the history of the world uh, and in the U.S., women have been marginalized. Women didn't get the right to vote until 1920 with the addition of the 19th Amendment. There are 18 amendments before it, right? In the 1960s, U.S. women fought for legal equality and workplace equality. The world has been and still is riddled with patriarchalism and misogyny, considering women less than, marginalizing women. And that's not how God intended it to be. It's a result of the fall. It's misplaced dominion. He shall rule over you. 
wherever there's oppression, wherever women are oppressed or abused or treated unfairly, it's a result of the fall. It's alienation in our relationships. Thirdly, then, we have alienation in our work. Alienation in our work. In verses 17 through 19, these are covenant curses to the man. Work is something that we were created for. It's part of our design. Work existed before the fall. Meaningful work, purposeful work, thrilling work, right? Picture a day that you felt most accomplished, most satisfied, where you felt the deepest joy in your work. That's just a taste, just a whisper of the work that existed before the fall. And also, I think of work that will exist in the new heavens and the new earth. But because of the fall, today we experience alienation in our work. Let's look at verses 17 through 19 here. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The serpent got two verses. The woman got one verse, but now the man gets three verses. And his sentence, his verdict, begins the same way that the serpent's verdict does, with the rationale. Back in verse 14, it was, because you have done this, right? But to the man, it's more specific, it's more detailed. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. You see, the rationale here is more specific. It's more detailed because of the weight of responsibility. Adam here is mentioned by name for the first time in the Hebrew. And kids, this is kind of like when your parents address you by all three names, Brian Charles Galt. You knew you were in trouble, right? When your parents address you by all three names. You see, Adam had the very voice, the very command, the very word of God not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But instead, he listened to the voice of his wife. And by the way, temptations often come in voices that contradict the word of God. And so Adam ate. And because eating is the action of disobedience, eating is now the location of the covenant curses. Eating occurs five times in these three verses. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Now in Genesis 3.15, it's a serpent that's cursed in 3.14. But here, it's not the man that's cursed. Did you catch the distinction? It's actually the ground that's cursed. And in Hebrew, there's a correspondence between Adam or Adam and ground, Adamah. You can hear it in the Hebrew. And, and after all, man was formed from the dust of the ground in Genesis 2-7. And he was put into the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And now the ground is cursed. The peace and shalom and harmony of the man and the ground has been broken. Now there will be thorns and thistles, verse 18, and sweat, verse 19. Work just got more difficult. In Greek mythology, there is uh, the story of Sisyphus. And Sisyphus cheated death twice. And as a result, Zeus and the Greek gods gave him the punishment of pushing this giant boulder up this massive hill every day. But here's the catch. Just as the boulder would get close, just he's almost completed the task 
the boulder would roll back down the hill again, and he'd have to start all over. Tim Keller says that this is a lot like thinking in today's workflow, if you were writing all day or coding all day, and just at the very end, before you hit save, your computer crashes, and the next day you have to start all over again. It's the futility and frustration and pointlessness of work, right? You will only eat in pain. You will only eat in pain. Speaking of the futility of work. <laughs> wow. Okay. God wants us all to experience this, or especially me, very intensely. We're going to give it just a second. And the good news is, I actually do have a printed copy this morning. Which we will be going to... Oh, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Is there hope? There's hope. Did you experience my pain there? Um, I think that's what God wanted for us this morning. You'll only eat in pain. And that word for pain only occurs three times in the scripture. And one of them was back in Genesis 3, verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. You see, the result of the fall is that now we have pain in our relationships. And now we have pain in our work. We have alienation in our relationships and alienation in our work. This is life outside the garden. And this is not how it was meant to be. Now, while the covenant curses come to woman for relationships and to the man for work, these are curses in representation, not in isolation. In other words, it's not only the woman who will feel pain in relationships. No, man will feel that grief too. And it's not only the man who will feel pain in our work. No, woman will feel that frustration too. Well, how do I know? Look at the end of verse 19. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Now, this is a section of covenant curses that are addressed to the man. But is it just man that dies? No. All humanity, all humanity will return to dust. It is the final and inescapable reality of this life. The final covenant curse, the ultimate consequence of sin, all humanity will die. You see, the curses are in representation, not in isolation. And so we have alienation. We have alienation in our world and alienation in our relationships and alienation in our work. And then we die, which is the greatest alienation of all. These are the covenant curses can you feel the alienation? Can you feel the brokenness? Can you feel the pain? But oh, brothers and sisters, here's the good news of the gospel. While this origin story explains how the world is, it's not the final word. One day when Jesus returns, he will vanquish the serpent, conquer death, and set all things right. Hostility and enmity in our world will be replaced with cosmic harmony and lasting fellowship. In Isaiah 11, the prophecy is that the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf will lie down with the lion, and the cow and the bear will graze together, and the nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adler's den. 
hostility and enmity will be replaced with cosmic harmony. And the grief and oppression in our relationships will be replaced with justice and joy. There will be no more grief in parenting because we will be face to face with the good, good Father. And the curse of He shall rule over you, the root of all oppression, will become the root of all joy and the ground of our ultimate freedom. Because when Jesus is King, the one ruling over us will be gentle and tender. The good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. He is your true husband, the one you've desired all your life. And the frustration and the futility in our work will be replaced with unhindered creativity and craftsmanship. The empty and exhausting task of Sisyphus will be replaced with work that is full of beauty and meaning and fulfillment and joy because Jesus accomplished his work. And alienation will be replaced with reconciliation. And pain will be replaced with peace. For he himself is our peace. And he has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. That he might reconcile us to God in his body through the cross. And depression and anxiety and loneliness and burnout will be no more. And death will be replaced by eternal life life to the full, life as it was meant to be, we will behold God face to face and we will walk with him again in the garden in the cool of the day and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Oh, brothers and sisters, don't you see? Everything sad will come untrue. And that's just a glimpse, just a whisper of how the world will be. And that's the first gospel. And we find it here, uttered with certainty on the very lips of God. You see, sin brings alienation and pain to every aspect of our world. But one day, Jesus will return and set all things right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Spirit, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come this morning feeling the brokenness, pain, and alienation of our world in different degrees, would you, by the work of your Spirit, and now by this sacrament before us, Bring us to the table and remind us that alienation will not have the final word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.